Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege again this morning to worship you, to unite our hearts and our voices, to raise our hands and magnify you, to bow our knees and our hearts before the King of Kings and tell you that we love you, that we're grateful towards you and for you, and that we honor you this morning. As we come together to sit under your word, may the word come forth with boldness and Holy Spirit anointing, may it encourage and motivate us, help us to leave from this place this morning encouraged and motivated to do what you've called us to in Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, Victory family and all our online friends, wherever you find yourself this morning. It's so good to be with you again this morning, and I trust that you are doing well. I'm sure that a whole lot of you, specifically in South Africa, are blessed and uh, excited about the fact that uh, on Monday, many of you could go back to work and re-engage with uh, society and communities again. And um, yeah, I just trust that it was a good week. I trust that uh, those of you that are still in lockdown, that you will stay strong and stay focused uh, so that we can get over and through this all as quickly as possible. And, and that's what I want to share with you about this morning. Uh, the word that I want to share with you this morning is called living a focused life for maximum momentum. Can I say that again? Living a focused life for maximum momentum. Um, as we are coming out of lockdown, there are truly many pressing and compelling issues that is demanding our attention and um, calling for us to hear um, and listen to the issues of life. And if we don't stay focused, uh, it is these things, these issues, very real issues, have got the ab ability to distract us from our kingdom purpose and mandate. And I want to talk to you about how do I stay focused on what God's calling me for and how do we corporately stay focused on kingdom issues so that we can gain and build a momentum so that we can get back to a flow, back to a whatever possible form of new normal and, and function as, as a people uh, of God, but also function as as a, as a nation and function as nations in the fullness of what God's called us for. So I want to read us a scripture out of Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, and then share a few thoughts with you this morning, if I may. It says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, it says, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Listen to this verse, verse 2. Set your mind, set your mind, on things above and not things of the earth. You know, to, to live a focused life means that I, I take my eye of the many things around me and I set it on something specific. Uh, when I focus and align, it means that I set my mind and I align my heart, my mind, my will and my emotions with the purposes of God and that which is God in store for me. That means alignment. And when I align myself, that propels me, that um, stirs me up and gets me into motion and allows me to pick up momentum. And so momentum is really the impetus gained uh, by a moving object. And the word impetus means really energy or force or the force the energy with which a, a body moves. And, and for right now, I don't know about you, but I need as much momentum, I need as much impetus in my life for myself, for my family. I need as much momentum for the church, the body of Christ. We need as much momentum as a nation in the economy so that we can come out on the other side flying and um, and encouraged to do what we're supposed to do now. Now, when we lose focus, when we lose uh, that alignment with what we're supposed to do, it's called distraction. 
And I don't know about you, but just even this last week as I listen to the news, as I'm aware of what's happening around the world and specifically in and around America and all the things happening there, I realize there are so many things, the economy, the racial issues, uh, tensions and pressures. There are so many things that are relevant but can sidetrack us into a loss of focus. And you know, when you start losing your focus when you are distracted by all kinds of things, a loss of focus can in, uh, end up in a place where we lose momentum and we get all discouraged or discouraged all over again. And I don't want us to do that. I don't believe God's intention for us is to get so discouraged that we lose momentum. William Ward wrote something about discouraged that I found very interesting. And I know it can be read in many different ways, but just listen to this for a moment. He says, discouragement is the dissatisfaction with the past, the distaste for the present and the distrust of the future. It is the ingratitude of the blessings of yesterday. It is the indifference to opportunities of today and insecurity regarding strength for tomorrow. It is the unawareness of the presence of beauty, the unconcern for the needs of humanity, unbelief in the promise of the old. It is the impatience with time, the immaturity of thought, and the impoliteness towards God. You know, I, I think it just spells out the minute that you lose focus, you get disgruntled and dissatisfied with everything. And I want to talk to you this morning, just as we come out of lockdown, just as we come out to re-engage and navigate our way back into society and with life, that we do not get to a place where we get discouraged before our time or discouraged at all. And for that, we need to be focused. So what does a, what does a focused life look like? And, and just allow me to share a few thoughts with you this morning. You know, I think first of all, a focused life is a Christ-centered life. Uh, a focused life is a Christ-centered life. I want to read you a scripture out of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. It says, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I, I want to say to you, first of all, that a focused life is a Christ-centered life. When we lose sight of Jesus, when we lose sight of the cross and what Jesus has accomplished for us on the cross, when we lose sight of grace, the kindness, the unmerited, unearned, undeserved favor of God towards us, when we lose sight of why He came because He loved and valued individual lives, then sacred things become secular arguments. Then self-centeredness, my perspective, my opinion, the way I see it, the way I say it becomes much more important than seeing a kingdom godly outcome. Christians end up fighting Christians. They lost focus because they lost sight of Jesus. And we need to remember that when we are Christians, when we are kingdom men and women, and we have got an accurate focus, there are times that we can lay our own agenda aside, when we can lay being right aside, that, that he being heard aside for the purpose of a greater outcome. That's why the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21, it says, He who knew no sin, had no sin, and did no sin, became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. Number two, a focused life is somebody that lives life out of a heart of gratitude. You know, we live in a society and we live in a day and time where entitlement is a big deal. It's a big thing. People make it something where they live life as to you owe me. And uh, 
And when children demand and don't appreciate, when they begin to expect things to come their way instead of living from a place of gratitude and thanksgiving, frustration sets in and the result is resistance. When we spend more time complaining and demanding and asking than what we do give thanks and honoring Father, we have missed something. We've lost focus. You don't know Father. You don't understand the kingdom and the ways of the kingdom. In Psalms 103, the psalmist says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Somewhere further down, he says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. In Psalms 100, verse 1 to 5, the psalmist writes, he says, When you come to God, enter his gates with thanksgiving in your heart and with praise on your lips. You know what? When we begin to get sidetracked, we don't give thanks. It's a by the way thing. What we do is we demand, we ask. We, we begin to come out when we come out of lockdown, when we come out of when we come out of where we've been, we, not with thanksgiving, but we come with demands. We're, nothing is good enough. Things are not changing quick enough. Things are not sorted out quick enough. There, there are people constantly demanding, constantly putting pressure on other people for what they want, and they think the world owes them instead of coming out with a heart of gratitude. There are some beautiful portions of Scripture all over the Bible, everywhere. I want to lift out two of them to you. In First Chronicles chapter 29, verse 10 through 20, David is about to take up an offering from the whole congregation uh, for the temple that they want to build for God. And, uh, and when David speaks out, as he invites the people and giving out of his own resources, as he gives from himself, he makes a statement. He says this, he says, God, everything that we have, everything that we're going to give to you, and everything that we will end up doing for you, all of that comes from you. And so we are thankful. He praises God. He, he, he honors God and realizes be, that, that everything he has, everything he's going to do, and everything he's going to give was because God was so kind and gracious to him. In another part of, the, of Chronicles, and I want to read this to you in 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 32, 2 Chronicles chapter 32, Hezekiah has known success. Um, and it says this, In those days Hezekiah, the king, was sick and near death, and he prayed to the Lord, and he spoke to him and gave him a sign. But Hezekiah did not repay according to the favor shown him, for his heart was lifted up, and therefore wrath was looming over him and over Judah and Jerusalem. And Hezekiah humbled himself for the pride of his heart, he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the wrath of the Lord did not come upon him in the days of Hezekiah. Uh, it's important that you and I know that if we want to see an amazing forward momentum, if we want to see God propel us forward and see things come to pass quicker than what we anticipated, just like in the time of Nehemiah when they build the wall in such a short time, it's important that we live out of a heart of gratitude and not demand, not thinking that we... God owes us or people owe us, but with a heart. That doesn't mean that we can't dream. It doesn't mean that we, that we can't move forward with a determination and with a sense of purpose. It just simply means that before we do anything, before we ask and demand and, 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 and try to change everything, that we live out of a heart of gratitude. Number three, if we want to live with a sense of momentum, and see things happen quickly, it's very important that you and I carry within our hearts a clear kingdom mandate. I wonder what your kingdom mandate is. I wonder what it is that God has called you to do. I wonder where God has given you a platform uh, of influence, where God is giving you uh, friendships and relationships, where God has given you a sense of authority because uh, he's placed you there, not just so that you could have a job and an income, not just so that you could fulfill certain of your personal desires, but where he ultimately has placed you, uh, knowing the kingdom values and the kingdom principles that he's bowled into you, knowing what it means to be forgiven, knowing what it means to have a God that loves you and cares for you. And
placed you there in that, in that uh, profession, in that situation where you find yourself, knowing that he's put you there to influence those around you. And, and people that live with a sense of momentum are a people that have got... Um, a clear kingdom mandate. You know, and when you have a clear kingdom mandate, you also live with a, um, a clear sense of stewardship, an understanding of stewardship because you know what it is that you're supposed to do. In Philippians 3.13, Paul writes, he says, I do not count myself to have apprehended. He says, I haven't arrived. I don't know it all. I have not completed everything. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind me, and reaching forward to the things which are ahead of me. I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Did you hear that? Paul says, he says, listen, I haven't accomplished everything. I haven't finished everything, and I haven't got it all together. But this one thing I do know is that I press towards the mark. I, I, I'm pursuing the thing that God has called me for. When you are focused on your kingdom mandate, you might see and acknowledge other, other pressure areas, other pressing issues, but you focus on what God's called you. When you know your kingdom mandate, you spend your time, your treasure, and your talent where God's called you. You don't get dra dragged along. You don't get dragged along with every discussion, every issue, you acknowledge them, and then you focus on what God's called you for, and you move on. It's interesting that right now when we are commenting and, and uh, responding to some of the pressing issues on people's hearts to see how people are getting dragged along by other people's opinions, how people are jumping on the bandwagon to not hear the real pressing issue, but just throw their opinion out there. It's a sign that they don't really know their kingdom purpose. When you do just kind of respond and allow everybody to drag you along with their opinions and what they've got to say, all you really do is you rotate yourself, you show your brokenness, your unforgiveness, you show your hurt in your heart and your lack of understanding. Because you see people with momentum acknowledge other issues, see the pressing issues, but get on with what God's called them for. Number four, people that live with kingdom momentum, with a focused momentum, are people who understand what it means to be generous. You know, real focused people know that the battle, the vision, and the course that they involve in is just a small portion of the bigger picture. They're people that understand that there are more out there than what they're doing. They know that what they have and what they call to is by the grace of God, has been given to them, through the grace of God, and they know that there are other pressing issues. And so therefore they live to bless others, to empower others, to share with others, and encourage others so that the bigger picture can be put together for the glory of God. They live out of a place where they don't keep everything to themselves and for themselves. There's a generosity about those that live with a sense of focus and purpose. I want to read you a scripture. Out of 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6, it says this. But thus he, I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. So let each one give as a purpose in his heart, not grudgingly or out of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. You know what? When we live with kingdom momentum, when we live a focused life, um, part of our heart is to bless others so that together those that are focused can move forward for a greatest purpose of the kingdom. And lastly, living a focused life for maximum momentum demands that we live in humility. Don't confuse 
meekness and humility with weakness and fear. Don't, don't confuse meekness and humility with weakness and fear. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, it says, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourself to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another. And be clothed with humility. It says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your cares upon him. When we lose focus, we make it all about ourselves, even when we don't think we do. See, proud people are people that are more concerned about what other people think of them, what they've accomplished, whether they are right, whether they've said it right, whether people think they are right, rather than the greater course of the kingdom. And for us to move forward with great momentum, we need to walk in humility. We're going to have to make sure that we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God and prefer others above ourselves. That is why God invites us to worship. Because when you worship, you have to bow your knee. You have to bow before. And so a people that want to walk, move forward with great momentum needs to be a people of humility. In Second Chronicles, this very same chapter, scripture that we've read earlier on, and let me read it to you again, Second Chronicles chapter 32. Hezekiah is in a place where he had success and uh, he didn't give honor and, uh, and praise to the Lord that blessed him. It says, but Hezekiah did not repay according to the favor shown him, for his heart was lifted up. Therefore wrath was looming over him and over Judah and Jerusalem. And then Hezekiah humbled himself for the pride of his heart, he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the wrath of the Lord did not come upon them in the days of Hezekiah. Hezekiah had gr very great riches and honor. And he made himself treasuries of silver and for gold and for precious stones, for spices, for shields, and for all kinds of desirable items. Moreover, he provided cities for himself and possessions of flocks and herds in abundance, for God had given him very much property. This same Hezekiah also stopped the water outlet of the upper Gion and brought the water by tunnel to the west side of the city of David. Hezekiah prospered in all his works. However, regarding the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon, whom they sent to him to inquire about the wonder that was done in the land, God withdrew from him in order to test him that he might know all that was in his heart. You know, as we re-engage with society. As we re-engage with one another in church platforms and in church life, as we reconnect with one another in the marketplace, uh, as I've said in some of the words that I've shared before we come out of it, we need to trust God that when we come out of it, something has shifted and changed in our hearts because we need to link arms for a greater purpose, not just for self-enrichment, not just for self-satisfaction, not just so that I can accomplish what I need to accomplish and have what I want and, and what I felt I missed over the time, but that we will link arms for the greater purpose of the kingdom because there are people that need to hear the message of the kingdom. There are people that need to touch the reality of what it means to belong to Jesus, the ways, the mannerisms, the conduct, and the behavior. And in all of that, there's a diversity of, of ways and a diversity of, of methods Yet they need to be a people united under the same king, in the same kingdom, with the same objective. And when we are self-righteous, when we become religious in our thinking about being right and not about seeing a life changed, pride grabs hold of us because we lose focus of the heart Jesus had when he came and he said he left the glory of heaven to come down to take on the form of a man, 
to the, to the very end of death so that you and I can have life. And, and if we want to see a wonderful forward momentum and a recovery quicker than what we anticipated, it's going to demand of you and me to walk in humility. The way forward is the way of humility. Pride can't do that. Pride wants to be right. Pride wants to make a point. Pride wants to say what it has to say, not because it is seeking the freedom and the salvation of others. It just wants to make sure that you hear their angle more so than anybody else's. And I want to say to you this morning, as we re-engage, as we navigate back into what we would like to be some form of normality, we need to live a focused life for maximum momentum. We need to be a people that know what it is to live a Christ-centered life. We need to know what it is to be a people that live out of a heart of gratitude. We need to know what it is to be a people that live life with generosity. We need to know what it is to be a people that have got a clear kingdom mandate. We need to know what it is to be a people of Christ-like humility. So let's trust God this morning that as we draw to a close, that we ask ourselves, uh, Father, how do you want me to live a focused life? Help me not to get distracted, even by important things. Help me not to get to lose focus and get dragged along with other people's opinions and other, other things and, and lose the reason why we stand up together for truth. Why we stand up together so that as we linked arms in our diversity, as we linked arms from, for, with our different opinions, that what it carry is enough truth, life, and way that point people to Jesus and give them a sense of momentum as they focus on what is the true value of life. And so I pray this morning that, um, that as you continue to live life, uh, with a sense of purpose and destiny that you live a focused life, that you uh, live a life that is, that is clearly focused on the purposes of God for your life with a clear understanding of who Jesus is in your life so that when you do live life and you promote what is important to you, it will all point back to Jesus so that the kingdom may come and the harvest can come in. And if you don't know him this morning, then allow me to pray with you a prayer of surrender. Father, I thank you this morning uh, that in the noise of this big world that we live in, that right now I want to take my eyes off all of that and put it straight on Jesus who died on the cross so that I may have eternal life uh, and live a life through your righteousness that you gave us. I pray this morning that... Uh, that you help me to focus on what is important and put first things first and last things last uh, so that I can see a momentum come into my life and live with a sense of destiny in Jesus' name. And for you that are struggling, Christian, uh, brother and sister, uh, as God is raising us up and releasing us back into a, a lost and challenging world, may your voice be clear. And may your voice uh, be directing others to the Christ in your life, the kingdom that we serve in, and bring them hope. And may we never confuse people because of our diversity, ending up contending against and with one another, forgetting what the real issue is. God bless you. Uh, we love you and we continue to pray for you in Jesus' name.